This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Armed men released the deputy Palestinian minister of health, Bashar al-Karni, hours after he was kidnapped from his home in the city of Bari. Karni said that in the late evening, an armed group of men kidnapped him and took him to an unknown destination, where they detained him for a number of hours. Around 11 o'clock at night, the house was raided by a group of armed, masked men. I was taken at gunpoint at an unknown place. My head was completely covered, so I was not able to see the people or the place where I was being taken to. My hands were handcuffed behind my back. The journey lasted until 5 a.m. in the morning. During this time, I was transferred to more more than one place and was moved into a number of cars. Of course, I was not able to recognize the people because I did not see anyone. There was no serious conversation with the people who carried out the kidnapping. What was understood towards the end of the kidnapping operation was that my kidnapping was meant to send a message to a Palestinian party. However, this message was not sent using safe or peaceful means. In Gaza, six leaders of the Fatah movement were wounded by shots that were fired at a group of people holding a funeral procession for three members of the security forces who were killed yesterday during armed clashes between members of the executive forces and the security forces in the Gaza Strip. The Higher Committee for National and Islamic Forces is expected to meet today in an attempt to contain these events and form an investigative committee which all factions can agree to. The events of yesterday cast a dark shadow over the Palestinian public, who fear that internal fighting will resume. Events included armed clashes between members of Hamas, the executive forces and members of Fatah, and the security forces in the Gaza Strip, during which five people were killed and many others were injured. This is continuing to occur despite the intensive efforts being made by other Palestinian factions and the Higher Monitoring Committee to contain the situation and continue the cooling-off period. We must set a date to begin the comprehensive national dialogue so that we can overcome these incidents which may escalate into a very dangerous situation. The phenomenon of deliberate killings and causing injuries in the scope of internal Palestinian differences is very dangerous. This must be stopped throughout the nation and through national consensus. This is what we will work for. The West Bank is also experiencing a security breakdown. Armed men in Ramallah released the deputy minister of health after he was kidnapped for a number of hours. Unknown assailants also burned the car of the Minister of Prisoner Affairs, who reiterated that incidences like this only serve groups who remain outside the national consensus. We are going to waste an opportunity to unite all Palestinian people and protect the pure and sacred blood of Palestinians. We will not give a chance to anyone who tries to transform the conflict into an internal struggle in the northern province. God willing, we will also try to reveal the identities of all these people who are trying to drag the Palestinian people into an internal conflict. There is opposition against the security breakdown in the Palestinian territories and the repeated kidnapping of foreigners, especially journalists in the Gaza Strip, the latest being a journalist working for a French news agency. Such events compelled journalists to hold a strike in front of the Palestinian Legislative Council in Gaza, calling on officials to take decisive measures to capture the criminals and guarantee that these incidents are not repeated.
The security situation in the Gaza Strip has escalated to a very bad level. Foreign journalists' lives have become dangerously threatened. Next, the lives of Palestinian journalists will also be threatened. Thus, we are demanding that the Palestinian Authority, the government, the president and the security agency to keep journalists out of the ongoing conflict. The repeated violations of the cooling-off agreement between various Palestinian factions have once again created tension within the Palestinian public. However, such violations strengthen the conviction by all parties that a political agreement is the best resolution to resolve these differences on the ground. Heba Akila, Al Jazeera, Gaza, Palestine. A rocket launched from Gaza landed in southern Israel, but there were no reports of casualties. Islamic Jihad claimed responsibility for the attack, which hit what Israeli authorities described as a strategic installation in the southern city of Ashkelon. Earlier, a homemade rocket caused minor damage to vehicles and structures in the city of Zderot. In the West Bank, Palestinians were skeptical that Israel would remove some 27 roadblocks there a day after the Israeli cabinet approved the move. The number of roadblocks and checkpoints in the West Bank is estimated at 400. But Palestinians say no changes have been made yet, and Israelis say removing the roadblocks and checkpoints would take more time and needs to be coordinated with Israel's security services. In the contrary, in the last weeks, there uh, are more checkpoints uh, in the West Bank area, especially in the exits, in eight exits of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, there is severe uh, and bad treatment of Palestinians in these checkpoints. Uh, the Israelis are the best group to talk about improvement, but in the ground there is deterioration. Uh, there is no improvement in the situation at all, especially in the roadblock. I think what needs to be done now is to find out if there are some checkpoints that uh, uh, we can uh, remove, but we should leave it to the Israeli Defense Force and to security forces. As I've heard, they are totally against this idea. Meanwhile, the Israeli defense minister has approved plans to turn a former army base in the occupied West Bank into a settlement for 30 Jewish settler families evacuated from the Gaza Strip last year. Israel Radio said Amir Peretz gave the final go-ahead for the construction of the homes in Masikot, a former army base that currently houses a military academy for high school students, adding that building work would begin in two weeks. The roadmap peace plan calls for a halt to settlement construction in the West Bank. In the beginning, you talked about Palestinian Prime Minister's visit to Tehran. Iran also pledged financial help to the Palestinian government. Can we conclude that Hamas has aligned itself with a group of countries that are opposed to the United States' influence in the region? Hamas has no other alternatives. It went to Arab countries. Some received it, but others did not. The Saudi Kingdom did not receive Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh or other Hamas officials. The United Arab Emirates and Jordan have not invited Haniyeh for a visit. How do you explain this? The American Secretary of State recently said that the United States would be willing to recognize a national unity government with Hamas in it. But some Arab countries are apprehensive about meeting with Hamas. Whose agenda is this serving? The American agenda... Arab countries did not receive the Palestinian prime minister due to American pressure. Even the United States needs to talk to Hamas. Now countries are being divided into groups. Hamas has joined the pro-Iranian group, although it is composed predominantly of the Sunni resistance movement. The pro-Iranian group includes Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, 
and now the Hamas movement. The other group, which Blair referred to as the moderates, includes Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and some Gulf countries. Blair's visit to the United Arab Emirates was not a coincidence. Perhaps Blair wanted to make sure that it will not join the pro-Iranian group. You do have clear positions against American foreign policy, but do you have any reservations about Hamas joining the Iranian-led group, which will be serving the Iranian agenda. Any Arab country that stands with the pro-American group actually stands between the Arab masses and their aspirations. The U.S. must first prove that it has good intentions for the Arab nation. Then we will think about whether we should or should not ally ourselves with it. U.S. led the war to force the Iraqi soldiers out of Kuwait and killed half of them. Then it led the war against Iraq and destroyed the country, its bridges and power stations. Arab countries gave the U.S. the legitimacy to occupy Iraq, which is the reason why we are now witnessing the bloody crisis there. Iraq is being divided and torn apart. Now the U.S. wants to form the coalition of the so-called moderate Arab countries so we as Arabs can be used as the firewood for its war against a Muslim country. Why should we waste our human and financial resources and compromise our principles? The U.S. says that the government in Lebanon was democratically elected and that it should not be brought down. This is logical. But what about the Palestinian government? It was also democratically elected. The entire world knows that the elections were transparent. Despite this, the U.S. government put the Palestinian government and people under siege since the first Hamas government won the elections. The U.S. should not use double standards. It should deal the same way with both the Lebanese and Palestinian government. Both are legitimate governments. The U.S. says that the Maliki government in Iraq is legitimate, despite the fact that it was created under occupation and despite the fact that it has been responsible for sectarian violence. Is this really a legitimate government, and the Palestinian is not? You are oversimplifying. You are saying that you have to choose between America and Iran. Iran is a Muslim country, and if I were forced to choose between Iran and the U.S., I would choose Iran. You are telling me that we may face risks by allying ourselves with Iran. Of course we may. You are telling me that Iran has its own agenda in the region. Of course it does. But you should keep in mind that the U.S. also has its own agenda there. The U.S. supports Israel and justifies its killings at the United Nations Security Council. At least Iran does not defend Israel at the UN Security Council. Iran did not support the partition plan in 1947 or Israeli settlement activities. To the contrary, Iran has been calling for fighting Israel. I draw my conclusions based on what we have seen. Mr. Abdelbari Atwan, as a Palestinian journalist, as a political analyst and a chief editor of the Quds al-Arabi newspaper, do you think that the Palestinian national interest would be best served by forming an alliance with Iran? Of course. You are saying this as a famous Palestinian who is known for advocating the Palestinian plight above all else? Iran is now confronting the U.S., which is a country that supports Israel, the country that supports my humiliation and the humiliation of four million other Palestinians. America is the country that supports Israeli settlement activities on my land. America supports the killing that took place in Lebanon, the destruction of half of the country and the killing of 1,500 Lebanese martyrs. Today marks the one-year anniversary since former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon suffered a brain hemorrhage and went into a coma. Dr. Renan Giesin of the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya worked closely with Sharon as his senior advisor for 10 years. He told IBS Leia Zinder that even though he did not know Sharon in the days of his heroic military exploits, Sharon carried the same leadership qualities into his position as prime minister. I did not fight with him at the Suez Canal. I wasn't with him in 1948 when he uh, uh, rescued himself from the dungeon uh, and the battlefield of Latrou. 
but uh, in a sense, you know, I could uh, relive his uh, his stories, you know. Uh, and of course, the, the, the way he looked at things, a long range approach, you know, of what faces Israel, uh, that was something that, uh, that I really liked. And above and beyond that, on a personal level, it was the sense of confidence, the sense of uh, security that he uh, bestowed on people around him. Even in the hardest moments, darkest uh, hours, I would say, he was always uh, strong, cold. Uh, never uh, watched, and that's why people in times of emergency, in the war in 1973 and later on uh, in 82 and when the war of terrorism, you know, people just latched to his tailcoats, you know, because he was, he provided that sort of confidence. He is the true epitome in my mind of a leader or, or, the, or really uh, represents the difference between a leader and a manager. Managers maintain, they do things, you know, in order to maintain, keep them up. Leaders lead. And leadership means that people will go after you to places they won't go after other people. I asked you what you miss most about him personally, but I think you've also told us what you miss most about him in the public arena as well. Yeah, that, that's true. But I, I say, uh, uh, for me, there was no public Sharon and private Sharon. <clears throat> you know, in the kind of discussions that we had and everything, uh, uh, the private Sharon was the same person that he was in public with, I would say, maybe a little gentler. I mean, if in the, pro in the public uh, he was an officer and a leader, privately he was a gentleman, a real gentleman. And uh, the very, very, I would say, uh, interesting discussions that we had, uh, and all through the telephone. Or, oh, we would meet at his office sometimes, and uh, I would uh, speak about certain things. I also did a lot more than just uh, read him the paper and talk about it. I wrote for him a lot. Uh, when he was in the opposition and then later on when he was in the Prime Minister's office. Uh, in a sense, I took uh, the, to some extent the role that previously the late Uri Dan uh, fulfilled, you know, writing for him and uh, being someone close to him who helps it with, the, the, with the writing with, uh, with the, and discusses with him, you know, intimate things. And uh, uh, I think I miss both. I miss Uri Dan, from whom I learned a lot, and I miss Sharon. Do you think a year later, if uh, Sharon were awake today, he would regret the disengagement in view of what has happened since? I don't know. It's very hard to say because if he was uh, uh, awake, uh, he was awake today and uh, and uh, in his full capacity. I doubt very much that the developments that took place would have taken place. In other words, uh, the fact that the war in Lebanon went as it was. Maybe there wouldn't have been a war in Lebanon. Cairo, an official from the Arab League announced that there are a number of initiatives being made to resolve the Somali crisis, including an American proposal that calls for holding a peace summit on Somalia in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi. Meanwhile, the Somali deputy, Hussein Adid, retracted his call to remove borders between Ethiopia and Somalia and issue a unified passport for both Ethiopians and Somalis. On the second day of the deadline that was given by the Somali Prime Minister to the armed groups to hand over their weapons voluntarily, the process of handing over weapons began slowly. A few weapons were turned in, including Kalashnikovs, M16s, mortar shells and one armored vehicle. We are pleased that the process of handing over weapons has started voluntarily, as you can see. Collecting weapons is one of the hardest missions confronting the interim Somali government, which is backed by Ethiopian forces. The government says that collecting the weapons is on the top of its agenda, which aims to establish order and return security to Somalia. The government gives priority to internal security, which explains why it has been focusing on disarming people and deploying police in different areas under its control. In a new development, the Somali deputy prime minister and the interior minister, Hussein Adid, said that they were planning to remove the borders separating Ethiopia and Somalia, enabling the two nations to use one passport to facilitate transportation between the two countries.
However, he retracted his statements after facing strong opposition from both government and the people. Most of the Somali people, who lived many years in overwhelming chaos amidst a lack of a strong central government, are preoccupied with making a living. Others, however, express concern about the Ethiopian intervention. We want Ethiopia to get out of our country. We want Somalia to solve its problems on its own. We are demanding that the world not intervene in internal Somali affairs. The Somali people who have been exhausted by civil wars for the past 17 years are still preoccupied with security concerns. A date has been set for the execution. A date has not been set for the execution. The lives of Saddam Hussein's half-brother, Barzan al-Takriti, and former head of the revolutionary court, Awad al-Bandar, are hanging in the balance until a decision is reached. The execution of the two men implicated in the Jujail incident is being debated by Iraqi officials, who continue to give contradictory statements. The last statement by Iraqi officials denied that a date was set for the execution to take place, while the Sadr movement confirmed that it would take place next Sunday. Our correspondent with the details. برزان التكريتي وعواد البندر كتب لهم العيش أياما أخرى بعدما كان بالأمس في عيداد الموت Barzan al-Takriti and Awad al-Bandar are going to be living a few more days after they were set to be executed yesterday. Today these two men remain alive amidst conflicting reports by the government regarding the date of their execution. A date for their execution was announced then later denied. Al-Sadr movement stepped in when its spokesman, Baha al-Araj, announced that the execution will definitely take place next Sunday. This statement has inflamed the fire started by those who yelled the name of Shiite leader Muqtad al-Sadr while Saddam was being executed. This was evident in the video footage that was leaked from the Baghdad Intelligence Center, which embarrassed the ruling Shiite Alliance Party and led to local and international condemnation, a condemnation that National Security Advisor Muwafaq al-Rabi'i tried to contain in an interview with American news channel CNN. He said that the yelling heard was for the morning prayers and described the dancing around Saddam's body as an Iraqi tradition. Al-Rabi'i said he did not think that this was humiliating to Saddam and that he was filled with pride after leaving the execution chamber. Nonetheless, the government of Nouri al-Maliki and Rabi'i himself could not hide their embarrassment. This may lead officials in Baghdad to think twice before filming the execution of Barzan and al-Bandar. In the midst of the contradictory statements regarding Barzan and al-Bandar's execution date, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Louise Arbor, appealed to Iraqi President Jalal Talbani to refrain from executing the two men after Nur al-Maliki's government denied a previous appeal not to execute Saddam. Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, announced his support of Arbor's appeal after he statements supporting Saddam's execution drew criticism from international human rights organizations and countries that oppose the death penalty. Meanwhile, U.S. President George Bush's aides said that he did not watch the video footage of Saddam's execution. In his first international appearance after the Christmas holidays, Bush chose to avoid commenting on the circumstances under which the execution took place. He turned his back to a journalist who asked him if he believed the execution was carried out appropriately. The question that the American president avoided was not difficult to answer by many Iraqis. In many Sunni towns in Iraq, condemnation of Saddam's execution continues to be heard during funeral services. The city of Fallujah was a destination for hundreds of Iraqis to attend funeral services in several parts of the city.
An Iraqi official source disclosed information about an American plan that aimed at helping the former Iraqi president escape just before carrying out his execution. An American general had confirmed that Saddam had requested to negotiate with U.S. officials before his execution. Saddam expressed willingness to help the Americans get rid of Iraqi Shiites and armed groups that have been fighting the occupation if his life was to be spared. An American general disclosed the last words of the ousted President Saddam Hussein, in which he expressed his willingness to comply with all American demands pertaining to attacking Iran and getting rid of Shiites and other groups that have been fighting the occupation if he was spared from the execution. Saddam's last words pleased American officials, or at least brought back to their memories the excellent relations that they have had with the former regime. Saddam was the main pillar for carrying out American agenda in the Middle East. He launched a war against Iran and took certain steps that paved the way for the deployment of Western military bases in the Middle East. The deal between Saddam and the Americans was underway and it almost reached the final stages until it was foiled by the Iraqi government. Maliki's government rushed Saddam's execution to prevent any future deals between him and the American forces. An Iraqi official disclosed an American plan to help Saddam escape before the execution. The same source said that the execution of Saddam was rushed to foil the American plan, which was discovered in the very last moment. He added that according to the plan, the United States was supposed to demand that the execution be postponed for two weeks, during of which some Arab governments were supposed to pressure the United States to cancel the death sentence. Saddam was then supposed to escape to Jordan, just like the former Iraqi Minister of Electricity, Ayman Samarai, who held an American passport. shot dead a member of the provincial council of Iraq's Shiite city of Karbala and his three bodyguards this morning. Meanwhile, hundreds of Iraqis gathered south of Tikrit yesterday to mourn the execution of former Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein. The developments with Layla Sulah. Violence erupted in the heart of the Iraqi capital once again as two bombs exploded near a petrol station in Baghdad's western Mansur district today, killing 13 people and wounding 23. Amid the hostilities, hundreds of Iraqis gathered south of Tikrit yesterday to mourn the execution of former Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein. Some were seen gathering around his grave and outside a march took place where Iraqis carried flags and portraits of Saddam and chanted in protest at his hanging. One banner being carried by his mourners read, We will miss our leader Saddam Hussein. However, a senior Iraqi official who attended Saddam's execution rejected accusations today that the Ousted leader was humiliated before his death, but admitted there had been some wrongdoing. As controversy over Saddam's execution continues, Iraqi authorities detained two justice ministry guards on suspicion of secretly filming the execution of Saddam and postponed hanging two of Saddam's henchmen today amid international pressure following the former leader's hanging. Barzan Ibrahim al-Tikriti, Saddam's half-brother and former intelligence chief, and Awad Ahmed al-Bandar, the head of the Revolutionary Court, were to have been hanged today after the end of the Eid al-Adha holiday. But a senior official from Prime Minister Mnouri Maliki's office, speaking on the condition of anonymity, said the execution was postponed due to international pressure. Both men are expected to be executed on Sunday. Meanwhile, UN Chief Ban Ki-moon backed the top UN human rights officials call yesterday for Iraq to refrain from executing the two men. In a related development, four Americans and an Austrian abducted in November in southern Iraq speak briefly and appear uninjured in a video believed to have been recorded nearly two weeks ago and delivered yesterday to the Associated Press. The men, security contractors for the Crescent Security Group based in Kuwait, appear separately on the edited video footage and three said they were being treated well. They were kidnapped on 16 November 2006 when suspected fighters in Iraqi police uniforms ambushed a convoy of trucks being escorted by Crescent Security on a highway near the southern border city of Safwan. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous Mosaic programs 
obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly Mosaic Intelligence Report. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, please send your tax-deductible contribution to Link TV, either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.